right, for our last talk of the session, uh, we have John Saunders from Royal Holloway. So thank you indeed uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, so the point of my talk is that uh, helium is a material uh, and it's simple. So how can we manipulate helium and do something interesting? And also we know how to get to temperatures in the micro Kelvin regime. So how can we work with people from this community uh, to advance the cause? <clears throat> Um, so, I'm from Royal Holloway, so first a few words to, uh, about peers in Royal Holloway. Um, so, uh, I'm, I think, in the century 2000 to 2010 in the classification. Uh, so, uh, Piers uh, was instrumental in starting the theory of condensed matter group at Royal Holloway, which is small and perfectly formed. Um, in some sense, then, this is one of Piers' second homes. You see, it's rather stately in appearance. Um, he founded the Hubbard Theory Consortium, uh, which is a collaboration among theory groups in the London area and uh, with experimentalists on the uh, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory site. Uh, he initiated condensed matter physics in the city, which runs sex in the city a close second, I guess. Um, I'd like to personally thank him for scientific collaboration and support over the years and helping uh, to make contact between the helium community and this community, and particularly uh, its theorists as well as experimentalists. <clears throat> um, so this is an experimental talk. So here's some cryostats. Uh, these produce temperatures down in the few hundred microkelvin range. Uh, so we have one that's concentrated on looking at uh, helium from the bottom up, as it were. So we have an atomically flat surface of graphite, and we grow uh, a layered helium film uh, on that surface, and that gives us a lot of flexibility. The other approach is top-down, so we engineer a nanofluidic cavity, and we fill it with superfluid helium-3, and we see what the confinement does to the superfluid. <coughs> Um, and then we have a third nuclear demagnetization cryostat, which we've dedicated to working on strongly correlated electron physics. Uh, so the two things we've been doing uh, most recently are to try and solve the problem of cooling a two-dimensional electron gas to below one millikelvin, which is important for studies of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And we've succeeded in getting a world record temperature of around one millikelvin by actually borrowing uh, techniques from the qubit community as to how to reduce power input into your samples. And most recently, we've been working on the superconductivity of ytterbium rhodium 2 silicon 2 that was referred to briefly by Chimio uh, earlier. So maybe I'll start off with that then. So I'm going to skim over the surface of many of these topics just to give a flavor of the kind of things that are possible in this temperature regime. <clears throat> uh, so there was this report in 2016 then uh, that the canonical heavy fermion um, superconductor with an in-plane quantum critical field of about 60 millitesla uh, underwent a superconducting transition at a couple of millikelvin, and you can see that there's a clear Meissner effect that was observed in, in low magnetic fields. Uh, also, what was observed was uh, a heat capacity peak that was attributed to nuclear spin order. Um, so there's an interplay between nuclear magnetism and, uh, and superconductivity. Um, and uh, the problem was, was that there was no transport evidence of superconductivity, and transport was perceived to be uh, a difficult thing to do. <clears throat> uh, so our approach then was to use squid amplifier-based techniques to measure the resistance. Um, so what do you do? Uh, um, you can do Ohm's law, uh, or you can measure the noise across a resistor. And so here's the circuit. So uh, this is a single crystal sample. The technique allows us to measure a single crystal sample, which has got a resistance of typically a, a, a milliamp. <clears throat> Uh, and so in this mode, the noise mode, uh, you get Nyquist-Johnson noise, uh, and that, so forget the red stuff for a minute. 
uh, and that drives the current through the input inductance of a squid when you measure that current. <coughs> and from that, you can, and it's frequency dependence, you can, uh, that noise spectrum, you can determine both the temperature of your sample, which is handy because knowing that you're cold is important, and you can also determine the resistance of the sample. <coughs> Alternatively, you could uh, do an AC drive, uh, and then you can decompose uh, then the real and imaginary parts of the current that you measure here uh, in terms of the sample resistance, which is dominated by, uh, this is the C-axis, so it's dominated by the resistance in the AB plane, and the contact resistance, which is current leaking out of the sample through the contacts, through these leads, and into the input circuit of the squid. <coughs> um, so both the contact resistance and the sample resistance then show the well-known transition from T-linear to T-squared behavior at the antiferromagnetic ordering temperature. <coughs> um, so... Uh, this is what happens as you go to yet lower temperatures. Um, so the blue dots are noise measurements. They show this uh, kink at this feature B, which was seen in the magnetization data. And then the total resistance, which is now the sample resistance plus the contact resistance. The sample resistance has got a strong contribution. It's dominated by the resistivity in, in the AB plane and the contact resistance has got a strong piece that's coming from the resistivity along the C-axis. That sort of meanders down to zero. <clears throat> and then in the driven measurements, we can separate out the sample resistance, that's AB, and the contact resistance, that's along C. And features of this that are worthy of note then are that the sample resistance shows a transition to superconductivity down here, where there's action along the C-axis at some much higher uh, temperature. And if you add this curve here with this curve here, they should sum to the red curve, and that agrees with the noise data, so everything is internally uh, consistent. And then the other neat thing about this technique as a bonus is uh, when this entire loop, including the sample, is superconducting, then the flux within that loop should be quantized. And so that's a definite proof of macroscopic quantum coherence in that loop. So we see that in this blue region here. So there is absolutely no question that this material is, is, is superconducting, but it's doing it in a very interesting way. Um, it's a three-dimensional metal, but the superconducting response seems to have some anisotropic character to it. And uh, if you look at the poster by Jan Asadel from Dresden on cerium rhodium indium 5, that's the material that I can see around in the literature that close, most closely resembles uh, this kind of action, a difference in the behavior along the C-axis and along the sample. <coughs> uh, so when we first saw this, this kink, uh, we identified that as it, had, it just felt that it had to be a phase transition. There was discussion in the earlier paper that this was superconducting fluctuations, but we think there's a genuine phase transition here. And this is some kind of dissipative uh, superconductor. Um, so then when we apply uh, a, a magnetic field, now we're looking at the, essentially the sample resistance. You see two things. Uh, the transition temperature is pushed down a bit. And in the larger fields, we see re-entrance of the normal state. <clears throat> and this curve here is looking at resistance as a function of temperature on a logarithmic scale. So you can see this corresponds to um, a fraction point, about 0.3 of a milliohm, and uh, this is about 15, 20 uh, nanoohms. Um, so we've got a factor of uh, more than three orders of magnitude change in resistance. So to the man in the street, that's a superconductor. And in field, we've got some dissipation here. We've also got some interesting signature here um, at just below 2 millikelvin, which we think is the magnetic transition in the sample. So if we summarize that uh, on this, this is the most honest and therefore the most confusing <laughs> a uh, phase diagram that I could plot. There are results here from two samples. Uh, on sample three, the blue sample, we did both the noise measurements and the driven measurements. And sample one was the first sample where we just had noise measurements. Uh, and this is showing various features and their dependence on magnetic field. <coughs> 
So th this, this feature here is in the driven measurements, the resistance going to zero. And so this slope tells you uh, that you're talking about heavy fermion superconductivity. The coherence length is huge. It's 300 nanometers. The effective mass is like 100, some, something like this. This is a heavy fermion superconductor that's emerge, emerging from a normal Fermi liquid state um, uh, with some kind of as yet unknown antiferromagnetic order. Uh, the putative uh, electronuclear ordering temperature, which is around 2 millikelvin, we also see in the data. That's down here somewhere. So we think the quantum critical origin of superconductivity proposed by Schubert et al is unlikely. Sorry, Chi Miao, but that's what the evidence is telling us. Um, I can't go into detail because I want to talk about helium in a minute, but uh, this is evidence for multiple superconducting phases. Uh, we're wondering whether it's spin triplet because YRS has got known to have strong ferromagnetic fluctuations and talking with Gill, uh, um, uh, ferromagnetic uh, spin fluctuations tend to lead to relatively low TC, so that might tie in with why is it in terbium compounds that TCs are so low. Um, if it's a spin triplet, hey, uh, maybe it's a topological superconductor. It's something to make you go into work the next day. Um, so at this low temperature, there's evidence for uh, a transition, this uh, electronuclear transition, which is influencing the superconductivity. Uh, and this TC against field line looks like a Pauli limited line. Um, so that may be also in indicative of a spin triplet phase where the D vector, the direction of spin projection zero, is by spin orbit coupling confined to the AB, A A B plane. Uh, what's the origin of the intrinsic anisotropy of the superconducting response? What's the origin of this dissipation? Uh, if this is a dissipative superconductor, it's a dissipative superconductor in zero magnetic field. So what are the topological defects then that are moving around that are causing that dissipation? So um, it's very exciting uh, material that we want to, we want to pursue. Um, so um, in my role now as the ambassador for helium, I'm going to switch to helium, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, so we have a fermion and we have a boson, and the idea is to man manipulate these isotopes, this material, in 2D and quasi-2D to create new materials. The advantage in comparison, for example, with the panictides is that they're simple, maybe they're model systems, they're probably not really quantum simulators because we can't dial up a Hamiltonian like the cold atoms people can. Um, but the advantage of that also is that we're going to get surprises. We're going to get emergent new quantum states. And the history of the subject is quite promising. After all, we have the first BEC, uh, the first topological, clear evidence of a topological uh, phase, uh, phase transition. Uh, Landau established the standard model of interacting fermions with liquid helium-3. We have superfluid helium-3, which is the first unconventional superconductor, um, and uh, it's also uh, topological, as I'll say in a minute. So if we look at the bottom-up approach, then here's the atomically flat surface of graphite. Um, and my assertion, then, is these are the classes of system that we can study. Uh, Two-dimensional Fermi liquids, uh, Hubbard transitions, quantum spin liquid, heavy fermion system with quantum criticality that I learned a lot about, actually, thanks to peers saying I could come to this meeting in 2006, and I met with Katerine, and she had all the great ideas about this and so on. And the, uh, an important future goal is to try to achieve a monolayer, two-dimensional uh, P-wave uh, superfluid. How is it that we can get that variety of systems uh, just by growing helium films on graphite? Two ingredients. The first is that the films are atomically layered, and the second is, is that we can preplate. Uh, so we can take the graphite and uh, if we just grow a helium-3 film on top of it, then we'll have a solid paramagnetic helium-3 layer and then a fluid layer. Uh, 
uh, but we could do something else. We could take the graphite and we could put um, uh, two layers of solid helium-4 or two layers of solid hydrogen or two layers of solid helium-4 and two superfluid layers. And each of those, each time we pre-plate in, in this way, we get to different physics, um, the kind of different physics that I'm um, describing. Um, so, what about the top-down approach then? Um, so, the idea then is uh, this is the phase diagram of bulk superfluid helium-3. Uh, we have two phases, uh, A and B. A is chiral, it breaks time reversal invariant, uh, and uh, B is a time reversal invariant um, superfluid. Um, so the contention then is that in the periodic table of topological quantum matter, arguably the missing element is a topological superconductor. And superfluid helium-3 provides the neutral version of that. So let's try to use that and ultimately gain access to the surface and edge excitations that emerge through uh, bulk edge correspondence. And on the surface of the B phase, for example, those will be Majorana-like linearly dispersing excitations. And so we're going to do that by confining the superfluid in, in some engineered uh, slab geometry. Um, technically, to do this, we had to develop very sensitive NMR techniques to see the very small amount of helium confined in these slabs. And we had to develop the nanofluidic uh, cell technique and I'm going to call this topological mesoscopic superfluidity because the uh, length scale that governs the height of cavity of interest is the coherence length, uh, which is pressure tunable in superfluid helium-3. It's about 80 nanometers at uh, zero pressure, going down to 20 nanometers at the melting curve. So what we can do is we can take a cavity with fixed physical confinement uh, then the effective confinement is the height of the cavity divided by this characteristic length scale, the coherence length, and we can tune that simply by tuning the pressure, so that's nice and flexible. Um, and this is a boring uh, list of the cavities that we've studied. Uh, most recently, we've gone down to uh, 100 nanometers because what we're interested in doing is accessing the region where the height of the cavity is less than the coherence length. And in order to do that, we have to, uh, we, to ask ourselves the question, what is it that suppresses superfluidity? Now, normally, it's going to be a disorder within the material. But we're talking about liquid helium-3. So there is no disorder within the material. So the suppression comes from surface scattering. But we can tune the surface scattering by putting a superfluid helium-4 film on the surface. And when we do that, the quasi-particles scatter specularly. And we've demonstrated in the 200 and 100 nanometer cell that we can um, um, achieve specular uh, scattering, eliminate TC suppression, and so that will then allow us, uh, for, by the top-down method, to access the quasi 2D limit, to get to a regime where, in the normal state, the liquid has size quantization because of um, the finite dimension in the Z direction, and move over into a two-dimensional superfluid regime. Um, and then more generally, you might imagine um, this idea uh, of, uh, that justifies me putting uh, three buzzwords uh, on the top, uh, or even four. Um, so now height is the new tuning parameter. So by just ch tuning the height of our nanofluidic cavity, uh, um, if the height is very small and we had rough walls, then we would have normal liquid here. Uh, here the height is larger and we'd have superfluid. So we can make an SNS junction. Uh, if this were uh, B phase, then we would have a very clean interface between S and N. It's almost like making a PN junction in silicon. It's the cleanest interface that you could possibly imagine. Uh, and at that interface, you're going to have Majorana fermions. 
how would that affect the tunneling transport between these two superfluid regions? Uh, you could create, a, let's call it a quantum dot or a mesa of superfluid. Uh, you could create um, interconnected cavities which could have the same height or different height. So I can, this is the buzzword slide. Uh, I could call that superfluid metamaterials. I could break rotational symmetry by having a series of posts in which I will, uh, that breaking of rotational symmetry will induce new kinds of um, uh, superfluid helium-3 P-wave order parameter in a, in a controlled way. I can make nano channels in which it's predicted that I will have uh, a chiral phase, a polar phase, or in your language, a pneumatic superfluid, um, and maybe spatially modulated phases. <clears throat> and talking of spatially modulated phases, uh, there's a prediction that uh, at, the inter at the boundary of the B phase and the A phase, uh, a stripe phase, a spatially modulated phase would appear. It's the analog of FFLO. And its origin comes from uh, a domain wall between here's a piece of A phase and, uh, sorry, B phase, and here's another piece of B phase where we've just changed the sign of this component of the order, of the order parameter. And these domain walls have negative um, surface, surface energy. And this arises because you get depairing by, uh, if the quasi-particles go through a, a scattering event that involves a sign change of the order parameter. And so uh, if you have a domain wall, then you'll have a sign change when you scatter from the surface, and you'll have a sign change which compensates that uh, when you go through the domain wall. And so you get this negative domain wall uh, energy. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the beauty of superfluid helium-3 is you can determine the order parameter by nuclear magnetic resonance, um, and that gains, uh, in, under confinement, you get access to various averages of the order, order parameter. If we just look at this one, in the stripe phase, uh, we have this plus, minus, minus, sorry, minus, plus, minus, plus configuration, uh, so this average is, is, is zero, and what we find is something that's actually not zero, so we can rule out stripes. Um, and uh, on the other hand, though, uh, we have something that deviates from a uniform phase, so we claim that this is evidence for a two-dimensional spatial, spatial modulation. Um, so uh, time uh, is, is marching on. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip, I think, uh, to this topic, which is something that Piers played a, a, a role in. Um, just quickly through, we can see mass diverging uh, MOP transitions in the two-dimensional helium-3 layer, uh, where the Landau parameter F nor A is more or less a constant, so that's consistent with the almost localized fermion model. And uh, we believe then that this MOT transition, which is happening at significantly smaller fillings than uh, one half, uh, corresponds to uh, actually a Wigner MOT Hubbard transition. So this is a density wave instability in two-dimensional two -dimensional helium-3, and that's related to these other, other systems listed down here. Um, this is the work on uh, quantile breakdown, quantum criticality, which emerged from um, this meeting in 2006 with Catherine. Um, we can look, uh, I'll bring this up actually, uh, at uh, coupled fermion boson systems. So here we have two solid layers of helium-4, two superfluid layers, and we're forming a two-dimensional Fermi liquid in a surface state on the superfluid helium-4, uh, and we can tune its density. So we have the possibility there of uh, coupling between the helium-3 via surface excitations. And the, probably the most interesting question is going to be what happens if we can tune the Fermi velocity through the, through the sound uh, velocity. And this is quite an interesting paper on coupled fermion Bose systems that I would recommend. Um, so we see a remarkable dependence of the Landau parameters on two-dimensional 
uh, density, uh, I think I'm going to try and say this because I think I have time. Uh, roughly speaking, these two Landau parameters, F1S and F0A, are of equal magnitude and opposite sign. That was a very surprising result. Um, if you just have S wave scattering, this is what you would expect. G is the interaction parameter uh, that has this logarithmic form in, uh, in two dimensions. So you can see F0A is first order in G and F1S is second order in G. So clearly S wave scattering doesn't, doesn't work. Um, we have to have uh, at least S wave and P wave scattering. And then uh, if we take the analysis of this Chupikov and Sokol paper and follow it through, the conclusion that we arrive at is that backscattering is dominating. Um, so we have um, a two-dimensional helium-3 system where uh, probably its characterization in terms of Landau parameters is not useful because the dominant scattering term is backscattering, which would be, have to be represented by an infinite series of Landau, Landau parameters. So it would be worth redoing the theory for that. Um, and so here is the, uh, the uh, super solid idea. Um, so super solids uh, in bulk, um, solid helium-4 have, uh, to put it mildly, uh, a checkered history. Um, so what we have in a uh, two-dimensional uh, helium-4 monolayer as we tune the density through is uh, by over a relatively narrow range is this family of curves. This is the mass decoupling of the helium-4 film from the surface. So effectively think of this as superfluid density. And Derek Lee at Imperial pointed out to us that we could describe this by some single parameter scaling formula. Uh, where there's one energy, energy scale that determines the characteristic temperature dependence and also the size of the superfluid density at T equals zero. And this data scales on two families of curves quite, quite beautifully. And to explain the linearity of the temperature dependence at low temperatures, then we in, invoke um, uh, an excitation spectrum that has a very soft minimum that soft minimum, according to the feynman cohen argument, implies that the structure factor is strongly peaked. And so Peirce suggested this quasi-condensate wave function. Um, so that's like a macroscopic Schrodinger cat state. If solid is dead and superfluid is alive, this is an entangled state of dead and alive. The end. <laughs>